Hold on. May proceed. Thank you, Your Honor. Good afternoon, ma'am. Afternoon. Would you please uh, introduce yourself to us? I'm, uh, my name's Mary Ripple. I'm a medical examiner, and I'm an associate medical examiner, and work for uh, Dr. James Bolter at the Volusia County Medical Examiner. Okay, and how long have you been there, Dr. Ripple? I've been in Volusia County, Florida since March of 2020. How about previous employment? Prior to that, I was a medical examiner in the state of Maryland for 20 years. Okay. Briefly, uh, talk to us about your medical background. Sure. Um, in 1985, I got a bachelor's of science in toxicology from the uh, Philadelphia College of Pharmacy and Science. Then in 1992, I got a master's in toxicology from the University of Maryland at Baltimore. I completed medical school in 1996 at the uh, University of Maryland at Baltimore. Then I did a residency in anatomic pathology at the Johns Hopkins Hospital, and I completed that residency in 1999. In 1999, I, I started a year fellowship in forensic pathology at the office of the chief medical examiner for the state of Maryland, and then I was hired there subsequently uh, in the year uh, 2000, and I'm board certified in anatomic pathology and forensic pathology. I'm a licensed physician in the state of Florida. Thank you, Doc. Why forensic pathology? Well, um, when I was in high school, um, we didn't have CSI back then. We had a show called Quincy Medical Examiner. I might be dating myself now, <laughs> but I thought, Man, there are doctors that try to figure out why people die. That's pretty cool. And then, then I got older and finally decided to go to medical school. And that's the kind of doctor I wanted to be. You know, I wanted to be the last doctor that somebody saw because you know then they can't speak for themselves. So maybe I can speak for them to try to be that sort of piece of the puzzle to search for the truth, figure out how and why they died. So that's why. Thank you, Don. And have you testified in court before as, in your capacity as a forensic pathologist? Over 200 times, yes, sir. And can you tell us approximately how many autopsies you've done? Over 3,000. Your Honor, I would tender uh, Dr. Ripple uh, to be allowed to make uh, opinion testimony. She's entitled to uh, render an opinion. Thank you, Your Honor. Can you talk to us briefly, Doc, about what is an autopsy? An autopsy is the complete external and internal examination of a body. And we're looking for disease processes. We're looking for injury. Also at that time, we might take some tissues or some fluids to do further testing on. And sometimes it's necessary to take evidence out of a body at that point. So that's basically And what's the purpose of an autopsy? Uh, also, I might say that photographs are taken during this time as we look into these deaths too, but the purpose of autopsy is to determine the cause uh, of death. Let's get specific, Doc. How about, uh, do you recall performing an autopsy on Officer Jason Rayner? Yes, sir. I performed the autopsy on the 18th of August, 2021. Had he been in the hospital for a period of time? Yes, he had. 
was he hospitalized from June 23rd of 2021 till uh, August 17th? Yes, approximately 55 days he was in the hospital, yes sir. Let's talk about you conducting the autopsy. Walk us through uh, how, how you received the body, where it came from of Jason Rayner, and what you did to begin your autopsy process. Well, what happens initially, we have forensic investigators in our office and they receive a call. So one of, that, excuse me, one of our investigators received a call from the mayor of the Halifax Health Medical Center saying that um, uh, Mr. Rayner had been shot and had passed. Um, so with that, she writes the report, gets information from the hospital and also gets information from law enforcement and any other sources of information and tries to get medical records to see if anything is wrong. So that's the beginning part. So even before you start the autopsy, you've got to So then the body needs transported from the hospital to our office and we have a transport service that does that. And the body was transported to our office um, by them. Uh, they're put in a little body bag, they're brought to our facility. Our, we have a gate outside our facility, they're, they're locked, they're brought into um, uh, the outside the autopsy area and they're put in a, in a cooler and the cooler is secure and the building is secure. So then the following day, the autopsy starts by taking photographs. So uh, photographs are taken um, of his external body, um, the facial shots, full body, everything with uh, therapy on, and then therapy is sometimes removed and we take pictures after that. Taking pictures of any external injuries we see or any bodily features like you know, scars or holes or tattoos, you know, just the general much everything uh, externally and then we um, the body is opened up it's been prison it looks like a wall it's opened up and then the um, uh, look for injuries or disease processes inside as I'm looking at the body externally though I might I might see things I might see certain injuries so I'm taking measurements and whatever I see outside disease processes or injury I'm documenting all that okay and then you look inside to see if there's any injury Sometimes there are, and sometimes there are additional things that you find. And we document all that. And then um, body fluids are taken, and if necessary, set for uh, testing for drugs and alcohol. But he had had such a long uh, hospitalization that really, you know, the toxic intestine was really the key to um, dying up. And that, so you don't send anything up for um, uh, drug and alcohol testing. Um, and then I'm documenting everything. And when I document, then I'll go back and I write up, I'll uh, write up the report. Uh, Thank you, Doc. So let's let's get some speci get to specifics with Officer Jason Rayner. First off, you said you did an external examination. Did you did you find any uh, injuries or wounds doing your external examination? And what was what did you find? Yes, I did. I found healing wounds. I found lots of evidence of therapy, but I found healing wounds. So, you know, you start by reviewing the records. So the, the records said that he had an infant gunshot wound in his left temple and there was a bullet that had entered that eye, right? So if I look, there is a scar. There's a scar right in front of his uh, left ear, assuming it's consistent with a healed uh, gunshot wound. I'm also looking around the wound for other things, for evidence of other stuff that comes out of the gun, but I didn't see any of that. I'm looking uh, also, um, uh, there's a scar here because the hospital had removed that bullet, right? So I make measurements for the top of the head and the sides, and so you sort of connect the dots. And this is where the bullet was found, and this is where the bullet is, all right? So then you look inside um, the head, and there was a massive uh, brain injury inside the head, right there. He didn't really have any other external injuries other than that. He had the scar here, and the scar here from the entrance wound, and the scar here from where they took the bullet out, and then he had evidence of a what's called a craniectomy, meaning that the big scar that went in here and went around and went over here. And what they did there was uh, at the hospital they took two of the big scar out because of all the damage in his head, the brain swells, there's not room for anything. So they take that off because the brain has been uh, removed from its structure pretty easily. So he had that scar right there. Uh, the other thing I noticed was he didn't have his left eye. 
the left eye that's been there is a, a prosthetic for the uh, half over and so there's a, uh, so that's why it's more it's a huge division around his eye. There's also yellow. And yellow means jaundice and that means it's liver failure everywhere also. So externally in general that you know tracheostomy tube, you know the dialysis dialysis catheter, and a, a wound that was open on the skin but closed below on the belly, and some drains in his, in, in his belly also, uh, some uh, medical intervention. So I'm looking at all that and I'm documenting all that. So those aren't injuries, but you know there's maybe some complications that, you know, happen. So that's why I need records and that's why I need to know these uh, facts and things. Yeah. So Doc, you said something I want to make sure we clarify or cover. That is, Sometimes you receive a body immediately uh, after, uh, let's say a crime, like a, a, a homicide or murder, mm -hmm. and, and the individual dies on the spot, and then there, you, you get the body right away, yes, or sir. within a within a brief period of time. There's no medical intervention. Yes, sir. And no medical records, really, can be used, is that right? Yes, sir. In this case, though, it was, what, 55 days, and there have been several medical interventions, correct? So, did you review the medical records as well? Yes, multiple, multiple medical records, actually. Yes. Quite a, quite a mountain of them, wasn't it? Yes, sir. So, in this particular case, you did your your examination, internal, external, but you also reviewed medical records from Halifax Hospital. Yes, sir. Okay. Your Honor, I believe that the defense has agreed. We do have a few photographs. Uh, if the defense agrees, I'd like to get them marked. It's State's Exhibit SS. I'd like to get it marked into evidence so we can have the doctor talk about them a little bit. Okay. Without, a, without objection, they will be admitted as evidence. Thank you, Your Honor. This will be State 46. Mr. Lewis, yes, can you go on the podium and just put her on the... Sorry, can you isolate that camera? Yes, sir. Or maybe, I don't know if you can. I, I can make it, I can pin it. Doc, with the court's permission, I'm going to have you come down so that you can we'll go through these photos. You step down. Will you stand by? Okay, there you go. Thank okay, you. Okay, Judge. What do you see on your screen? Just. Just her. Just her. Okay, all right. You step down. You must speak loud, though, because everyone has to hear what you have to say, okay? Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you. Counsel, feel free to move out. I neglected to say during the autopsy we also take uh, post-mortem x-rays or post-mortem radiographs and this is one taken at our office uh, when Officer Mayer uh, arrived. We do that first before we usually take anything else. So he has, you can see, he has no part of the skull here. That's a medical intervention again because when he was shot with such massive bleeding and damage in the air that such pressure comes up, and think about it, your skull is solid ball. Okay, so if stuff's in there, like bleeding and, 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 and swelling, there's nowhere for that to go, so your brain gets pushed. So this is one of the medical interventions they use. They take off a piece of your skull so that the brain has some room to move so it doesn't push on other important things like blood vessels and things like that. Okay? And Doc, would you consider that an license attempt to save Officer Rayner? Absolutely. If they wouldn't have done that when he arrived, he would, he would have died that day. So, and then they also did other medical interventions I'll talk about later, but with regard to um, the x-ray, along the, the wound path, the entrance is about here, but again, the part of that skull has just been removed, but I can see the scar on the skin, okay? So there's all these little white specks that are across here are all small fragments of the bullet. Now the 
main bullet mass has already been moved, removed at the hospital, I believe uh, in uh, mid-July. Um, and that was taken from right there. So the main bullet was here, but there's all these other fragments along there. And those fragments are embedded in what's left of his brain in the front, the bones in front of his face, and the bones in the skull. I actually was able to recover three of them at autopsy. So I have three fragments that I recovered at autopsy itself. In addition, the other, you can't see them that well, but the other little lighter pieces, not so bright white, are pieces of bone, also are pieces of bone that have been pushed in uh, to the skull also. Okay, and Doug, what about the top segment? Yeah, if you want to reorient it next time. A facial identification photograph we take at the time of autopsy uh, showing Officer Rayner. He has um, uh, black acceleration around his eyes, and that's because as the gunshot wound came in and lodged here, there's a scar right here from where they removed that bullet, all right? So as it came across, it, it damaged the, the top part <coughs> of the eye socket, okay? So your brain sits on top of, of the base of the skull and the front part of the roof of your eye because you can actually be strong if you lift up on your eyebrow, okay? They're all smashed, okay? Not only are they smashed, there's hemorrhage around them that has remained there it's been sort of a healing hemorrhage uh, since the day that he was shot. This eye in particular looks a little dark here, and there's actually a little tear here. It's because this is not his eye anymore. They had to take his eye out because I'll explain in the past what happened, but it, it basically killed that eye, and so they had to take it out. There's also a little yellow looking, all right, scar there. That means liver failure, okay? Build up of the chemical in the body called bilirubin. Embedded in the front part of the skull, um, uh, right above his eye, uh, and behind your forehead, were these two little fragments. So it goes into your right skull bullet fragment, okay? And I removed those. And then this larger fragment, right fragment, right frontal lobe. So you have two front parts of your brain, two lobes. They may have a number of their own. Well, John, I'd like to show you what he's referred to in the brief, but perhaps you could come in for it. Probably the head. You want to let him down. Would you please look at this exhibit? It's identified as state exhibit TT. Do you recognize it? Yes, these are the fragments that were put in envelopes that we just saw on the screen. And my name is actually on the back. I signed the, the back of these. So those are put in for evidence uh, to give to the investigating agency. Um, and that's what they saw. Okay. Your Honor, at, at this time, I'd ask you to remove the remainder of evidence. Without objection, admitted as evidence. Permission to call this exhibit, Your Honor. You may do so. And you can see 
Chris Yellow again, because he had this crazy ostomy tube to help him breathe. This catheter here is a dialysis catheter, because from day one he was at kidney failure and needed dialysis. So that is from kidney failure, the yellow is from liver failure, which is also where um, uh, he, um, the Chris said that he was in the hospital. This is a closer up of it. This is the scar from the entrance gunshot wound. It corresponds to the hospital records. And to me, the scar is consistent with a healed gunshot wound, okay? Then that craniotomy scar that came around the back of the head, you can see that that part of that scar from where that part of the skull is. So this is that scar from the entrance gunshot wound. It had 55 days to heal, okay? So I look around that, I look around the scar even before it's shaved, I look for the other stuff that comes out of a gun, like gunpowder clips, things like that. But you know, it's been a while at the hospital and he's had medical intervention. But what happens when unburnt particles of gunpowder hit the skin, it causes a little break, a little pinpoint abrasion? Well, maybe I would see those little pinpoint scars, but I really don't see them. Again, he's had medical intervention, and this little thing here and this little thing here are more consistent with what he's remarked to me uh, when they showed up the wound. So I don't see any of that on the wound, um, and I don't see a big blowout tears everywhere around it either, like I don't think you would see with a white up gun. So that's what I'm looking at. I'm not just looking at the hole. I'm looking at everything else around it and what it looks like and the shape of it, and I'm also reviewing the medical but I would defer to medical records because they saw it fresh, for lack of a better term, okay? Then, this is his left eye. Again, his left eye isn't linear anymore. When the bullet came across, it basically jumped out of the socket and killed the eye. Uh, so they had to take it out. So the, what's in there is not actually that. It's just the, it's the socket. Thank you. Are those the only photographs you're going to use? Yes, sir. Okay. Doc, I might be getting ahead of myself a little bit, but I'd like to jump to the uh, manner and cause of death, and then I'd like you to explain how you reached that conclusion. Okay. Sure. So, were you able to determine after your autopsy examination with a reasonable degree of medical certainty what the cause and manner of death? Yes. And what what were they? Cause of death is gunshot wound of the head with complications, and the manner of death, homicide. And homicide means that that, that uh, hum one human being being killed another. Correct. Homicide is actually a medical term. It does. It means the act of one or cause. Okay, so let's talk about that a little bit. Um, you said complications, and I think you touched on it a little bit in your testimony about the liver and the kidney. Could you start there? Start with the liver and explain to the jury how a gunshot wound to the head can impact so substantially on the liver of an individual or on uh, Officer Rainer. All right. You obviously have the immediate damage of the bullet coming through, tearing the brain, breaking skull, all that, brain swelling, brain bleeding, etc. So when pressure builds up in the head, um, also say he lost blood through the hole in his head and he also lost blood into his head. So he's, he's bleeding, all right? And then there's something called a systemic stress response when you have head injury. So what happens is your body is trying to put all its power into the quote unquote more important organ, so your head and your heart. So not only is there hemorrhage and bleeding that's taking blood away from the other organs, your brain, because of the pressure buildup in there, is saying, whoa, these things below the diaphragm, I don't want them to get as much blood as my heart and, and, and the head are. So there's something called a hypoperfusion, it's called a shock liver or shock kidney. So 
these are not being perfused as much. And like I said, his liver functions and renal functions from day one weren't very good and they went progressively down, up and down. Now, with the liver, it's really important because the liver makes a lot of important stuff, uh, proteins, et cetera, that help uh, with uh, body and Doc, you said perfusion. What, what did you mean by that? Lack of blood? Or perfusion means low there, lack of oxygen. There's lack of blood and oxygen getting uh, to those organs. So what happens when that happens? The kidney cells die, the liver cells also die. Did you see evidence of that? Under the microscope at autopsy, yes. What about the kidney? The kidney showed chronic failure, yes. And like I said, he was on dialysis from Doc, I'd like to uh, through some of your complications with you. Um, how about the, the, the gas, the issue involving his stomach and bleeding? Could you talk about that a little, please? Okay, so the liver. It all goes back to the liver. And why is the liver bad? Well, because of the gunshot wound to his head. Everything goes back. The whole chain of events started because of that gunshot wound to his head. Okay? So his liver's bad. Liver makes almost all the proteins you need to make your blood clot. It also is a bunch of proteins that break up those clots. Right? Normally, the liver's in a nice balance. Has a lot of living cells. It's happy. Well, his liver is, is damaged already and dying, so you have less reserve. So any little tip in your condition, any little inflammation, anything, you're going to clot, you're going to bleed, you're going to clot, you're going to bleed, you're going to clot, you're going to bleed. And throughout his whole hospitalization, it was like one step forward, two steps back, two steps forward, one step back, and we just don't have enough reserve. So we had three episodes of major bleeding. Mr. Uh, Lorizzo is talking about the first episode of major bleeding, okay? And that was on the 9th of July, okay? where he has a tube in his stomach, okay? Not only did I show you the trach tube and the dialysis catheter, he has a tube in his stomach because he can't take anything by mouth, okay? So he has a, a tube in his stomach. He, uh, the word used in the medical records, incidentally or accidentally, pulled it out, okay? When he did, it caused a lot of bleeding in there, okay? But it's not just from pulling that tube out. When they went in to check, the surgeon's records, both uh, surgeon's records state that in the area where that tube was pulled, of course there's a tear, and that blood's going to, you know, that's going to contribute, but the stomach was already damaged in that area, okay? Ulcers, skinny ulcers and hemorrhage all around it, okay? So it's not like a normal stomach wall, so it's thinner, it's more susceptible to injury, and it's already ulcerated. Well, what does that come from? I'm taking the surgeon's word. They're called Cushing's ulcers, okay? You only use the term Cushing's ulcers when the ulcers are a result of head injury, they're saying. Well, how in the heck do you get ulcers in your stomach when you got injury to your head, okay? Well, what happens is all that buildup of pressure, okay, from day one pushes on very important parts of your brain, one area called the hypothalamus, one area called the brain stem, but pushes on important areas that stimulate a certain nerve. That nerve is called cranial intent, it's called the base nerve. So what does that nerve do? It causes acid to so that build up of pressure, push it on those areas, stimulates that vagus nerve. Now it's acid, 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 acid in the stomach. And what happens? I think most of us know stomach acid causes ulcers. So that area is already damaged. And the words are from the surgeon, from the medical records, Cushing. So that's where that bleeding episode came from. And he recovered a little bit after that also. It was 39 days he lived after that incident. But he had two other major bleeding episodes. Talk about this, please. The other major bleeding episode. The second episode of bleeding was on uh, August 11th, where he threw up a bunch of blood, and then he had a very large bloody uh, bowel movement, okay? So again, they go back in, and they're trying to look what's going on. They didn't put the, the tube back in the stomach. They actually had to take part of his stomach out, okay, when that first surgery. They put the, the next feeding tube was put in his small bowel, okay? Well, they're going to look around in there too. 
they didn't see any ulcers, but they just saw clotted blood around it. And when they went in, there wasn't any active bleeding or anything, so they were able to stabilize him. He got a little better after that. So that's the second major episode of bleeding, all right? All this is putting stress on the body, obviously, in this organ. Third major episode of bleeding happened on the 14th of uh, August, and that's the main episode of bleeding from which he had no more reserve and could not recover. So what happened was, initially, remember, the, the, the bleeding was on this side, called the subdural under the covering of the brain. Well, this time he had to bleed on this side of his head. So the, the final thing was that bleeding on this side of the head, that again, built up a bunch of pressure, okay? And when that happens, the brain's trying to escape. It can escape a little bit through here, but the brain was, it was pushed out as far as it could go through there. And then it tries to curve around and it, it, it herniates, meaning it squeezes in places it shouldn't go around that covering on the brain and also tries to push down into the spinal column. There's a hole there where the spinal column comes through. So what happened with that big bleed on the 14th of August, major bleed on this side of the head, again, increased pressure, cutting off little blood vessels. So as they push down, all the little blood vessels on the bottom are like, they're squeezed, okay? So what happens when you squeeze a blood vessel or have a block in it, you get a stroke, okay? So he got multiple little strokes after that. So that last bleed on the 14 was it. He could not compensate anymore, and he went into multiple failure to bleed, and that's when he, he died only a couple days later. Doc, let's talk a few minutes about some other issues that, that are part of your autopsy evaluation. You've talked about the gunshot wound, and you've identified for us the entry wound. Talk to us a little bit, if you can. First, were you able to determine the path or trajectory of the, uh, of the projectile or bullet? And if so, how so? Well, I look at the medical records if, if they help in any way, but I have two scars that I can connect. Okay, I don't have a lot of bone left over here because of all the fractures that occurred and whatnot, but I have a scar right here, right? That's where they got the bullet from. And what do you do? You connect the dots. So where's this? So it's left to right and a little bit back to front. It didn't seem, if you just connect the scars, that's it. It doesn't seem to be any, a lot of up-down deviation. So primarily left to right, a little bit back to front. Really not a lot of up down. Okay, so when you when you were pointing to your to the left temple, that's where the entry is. Entrance bullet. Entrance bullet. Okay. Let's talk about the proximity of the of the uh, gun, the nine millimeter. Uh, let's talk about close contact. I think, and if you need the if if the Photograph will help you, we can bring it out again. But I'd like you to explain to the jury what you're looking for and what you think. All right, for, for distance, obviously it would have been better if I would have seen right away. So I, on all distance things, I would defer to the, the clinicians who saw, saw the wound, okay, because they saw it less. And they're contacting, so you can have the, the barrel of the gun right up against your head, tightly, all right, or you can have as far as distances away. When the barrel of the gun is up against the, uh, the head, because there's not a little room for the scalp to expand, if it's up there tight, you're going to get a lot of little blowout lacerations around it, okay? It's a small um, hole, relatively, and the hospital records don't mention that, but again, he's had medical intervention, I would defer to them. The other thing, if the muzzle of the gun is up against the head, usually away, not always, but usually away from the wound, you're gonna get a little abrasion, a little circular, semicircular abrasion. From what? The muzzle imprint is gonna leave a little mark, okay? I didn't see any separate scar beside there that looked like that to me. Also, I'm looking inside the wound, because all that, not just the bullet comes out, all that burnt particles of gunpowder and unburnt particles of gunpowder, they would go in the wound too, okay? He's had a lot of uh, surgery. He's had debridement. Debridement means they've taken dead tissue out. They gotta take it out so the wound heals and so he doesn't get infected. So that might all be removed, I might not see it. That's why I would defer to the surgeon. But externally, it doesn't look like a contact to me. Can I really tell for sure? No. 
I did then look under the microscope. I didn't see any black stuff in there at autopsy, but then I looked under the microscope under there to see if I see any black stuff. There wasn't anything under there that was definitive. So I looked but did not find. It's, I can't honestly tell distance, but I don't, I don't, it, what, the external features of that scar are not consistent with a hard contact on something. With a hard contact, do you mean actually pushing with a rifle to the head? Yeah, hard and pushing, yeah. Did you see any, anything in the medical records, uh, one way or the other? I didn't see anything, but you know what? They're trying to save his life, so I don't, I, it, sometimes they note things, sometimes they don't. But just like I said, to be honest, I, I can't tell definitively, but I would defer to the clinician. They should be able to see all that stuff, right? So, um, so after uh, you've got contact, yep. hard contact, what's the next level of separation? The next is a couple inches away, like six or inches or so. It all depends on the gun, okay, but just a rule of thumb, about six inches. All those burnt particles of gunpowder are going to hit the skin and that's hard. Okay, so it's the burnt, so it's like little black smudge around the wound, okay? I didn't see any of that. Well, they would have washed that away for sure at the, at the hospital, okay? You're not going to leave black smudge around the wound, okay? So if I didn't see that, so I would defer to the clinician. Next, one's a little farther away. And again, it depends on the gun. Rule of thumb is two to four feet or so. Now you have not just those burnt particles come around in six inches from the clip, you have unburnt particles of gunpowder coming out. And when they smack against the skin, it causes a little, they stick there and it's like little flakes, okay? So you get little chunk shaped, like skin point abrasion, okay? This is how Dave, I'm, I, I, as I showed you in the picture, I don't see anything really consistent with that. Are the clinicians gonna see that? I don't know, okay? Um, but I would defer to them. But I didn't see any small scars around the wound. And then following that as a distance from shot wound, which has nothing. Okay, and then you, so you've testified to hard contact and now. Close range, which is the soot, which is six inches, and then intermediate range, which is two feet or so away with the gunpowder stippling, hitting the skin, and then distant. Okay, um, so. I believe you're testifying that you, you didn't see any stippling. I did not see stippling. But of course, you also indicated that uh, it was 55 days later and there were a lot of medical intervention. Correct? Yes, sir. So you really can't say if there was any or not. You defer to the, to the medical. Yes, I do. I, I cannot tell. Okay. And uh, you, I believe you said, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, that as far as a close contact, you didn't consider, you didn't see any evidence of that, and you didn't, that was less likely it was a close contact wound or hard contact? I cannot tell definitively, but that scar doesn't look like a hard contact. Okay. Let's talk for a minute about where the officer Rader was and where the defendant was. Can you really uh, testify with any medical certainty or, or tell us what the position of the body is? No, I cannot. And tell us why you can't do that. Well, I don't have anything to go on on the body uh, because of you know time passed and medical intervention. And I was able to see that video and I, I can't tell, it's too dark for me. I can't tell. So. And bo the bodies move? Yeah, bodies are moving. There appears to be some physical interaction going on. and. You just can't, I can't tell personally, I can't. There was some mention in your autopsy about COVID. Did you, uh, with uh, Officer Ray? Right. Talk about that for a minute. I just gotta refer to my notes so I get the, um, my autopsy report so I get my uh, date straight. So I guess on the, he gets, he's shot on the 23rd and on the 25th, he has a uh, COVID test that comes up positive, okay? But that's the nasal swab that we all know about. Um, and then, the, then it's, he's retested again that same day, and he's retested the next day, and they're negative. And then you, that's the PCR test, so that's the gold standard for it. So the hospital thought it was a false positive. 
I thought it was a false positive, but you know what? I looked at microscopic sections of the lungs, okay? Because he did also, in addition to that brain bleed, he had pneumonia at the end too. Because he had some bacteria growing in there and he aspirated a little bit. Looking at the lungs, and unfortunately, I've seen enough COVID lungs to know what COVID looks like. So looking at it under the microscope, it was consistent more with an Was it, medically, was it surprising to you uh, that Officer Rayner hung on for 55 days? Yes or no, sir. I'm sorry, can you repeat the question again? I asked if it, from a medical point of view, was it surprising or what her impression was of the fact that Officer Rayner lived for 55 days? Oh. Dying is a process. And as I stated before, he took, he rallied, he had one step forward, two steps back, one step forward. You can't predict if a person's, you know, ability to compensate with an injury or their response to therapy, et cetera. But he had pretty devastating brain injury. And uh, I am a little surprised that he lived that long. Is there any doubt in your mind, Doc, that Officer Rayner died from the gunshot wound that was inflicted on him by the defendant on June 23rd, 2021. Absolutely. He died of that gunshot. I tend to the witness. Thank you. Any cross examination? Good afternoon. Did you watch the uh, body worn camera footage in this case? Yes, um, you, you talked a lot about the. Uh, the complications that Mr. Rayner had as a result of the gunshot wound. Do you recall that bit of testimony? Yes. And, um, would you agree that uh, there's nothing about any of the complications, whether it be bleeding or liver issues, uh, that shed any light on positioning of Mr. Wallace and Mr. Rayner at the time of the shot? Yes, absolutely. Yes, I think that there was no proper okay. And same, same question as it goes to uh, in terms of the, the trajectory of the proximity of the gun. The, the complications don't offer any any support for, for any theory on either side, right? No, that's correct. I do not. Okay. Um, <clears throat> and you mentioned that the trajectory was, uh, and please correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I, I think you're classifying more in the general sense of left to right and back to front? Yes, inside the body. Okay. So inside the head, it's left to right and slightly back to front. Yes, sir. Okay. And with, from, from what you're able to tell, um, you know, a, a millimeter of difference in, in of the position of the gun could have changed. That's what we're talking about here. I mean, millimeters, inches. How, how much movement in the gun really affects a trajectory? Well, it's not just movement of the gun. It's movement of the person holding the gun, and it's the movement of Mr. Rain, Officer Rainer's head. There's a lot going on that alters the, the that. Yes. Okay. So it's 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 not fair to draw any real conclusions on the positioning, even from the trajectory. Oh, sure. Yeah. Okay. Um, and it doesn't look like, I, I'm familiar with the term uh, point blank, but I think you were describing it as contact if the muzzle of the gun was up against a person's head. Point blank can mean lots of things, but that's one of them. Sure. All right. And we can't necessarily rule that out, but it seems like that's uh, based upon the observation of the injury, probably an unlikely scenario. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And uh, you can't necessarily say it was uh, six inches, 12 inches, two feet, four feet. And is there anything in terms of the uh, medical analysis that you performed that would uh, disprove a claim of self-defense in this case? Nothing to do with what I did. Okay. Thank you, ma'am. I think can you read, right? No, sir. Are you witness be excused, state? Yes, sir. Defense. Yes. You're released from the subpoena. Yes, sir. 